getting to order as well. Uh, it's one o'clock, so we'll start. For everybody coming along, uh, I'll just read the opening statement. Welcome to this meeting of Planning and Development Committee. Good to see you all in person, albeit with COVID safe measurements in place. I'd like to remind you, please, in particular, for the protection of us all, to continue to adhere to social distancing, to continue to wear your face covering when moving around the building, to avoid mingling after the meeting. I'd like to confirm that this meeting is being filmed for live or subsequent broadcast via Borough Council website on the internet. We are operating a system of two roving microphones. Please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Then when it is your turn to speak, I will announce your name and an officer will bring you the roving mic. Em emergency evacuation procedure. Whilst we are not expecting any fire alarms today, in the event of a fire, an automatic announcement will sound. Should this happen, please follow the green signs and make your way quickly but calmly outside the building. The safe meeting point is south side beyond the cliff lift. Staff will be on hand to guide you. The spa complex is equipped with a fully automated fire alarm system and if an outbreak of fire is detected, a recorded announcement, announcement will immediately be transmitted over the public address system. Toilets are available to my left in the main foyer. Ladies and disabled toilets are on this floor whilst gentlemen are on the one floor down. Uh, we shall now begin the agenda. I have one apology from Councillor Trumper. Are there any other apologies? And Councillor Stuart Campbell. Any other apologies? No? Good. Uh, declarations of interest. Any declarations of interest by anyone? Yes, Councillor Richmore. Whilst it's not actually a declaration of interest, I'd just like to uh, make chair aware that I've got a free standing appointment later on this afternoon, so I may need to leave around 3.30. Thank you very much. Thank you. Members are reminded of the need to consider whether they have a disclosable pecuniary prejudicial or other personal interest to declare in any items on this agenda. Details of any interest must be declared at the start of the meeting or as soon as any interest becomes apparent during the meeting. Is there any member willing to propose the minutes of the meeting held on 9th of September as a true record of the last meeting? Uh, Councillor John Casey and Councillor Bill Chart to second. Thank you. Can we take a vote on that? All those in agreement? Thank you. Any abstentions? I wasn't present, so I can't vote on it. Thank you. That's an abstention. I'll just sign the minutes before we proceed. Uh, there is no public questions received, so we'll go on to uh, the next item is number four, but we have had a request for item seven to be deferred until next meeting. So if that's okay, would somebody like to propose? Uh, Councillor John Casey, anybody seconding it? Councillor Bill Chant, thank you. Sh shall we take a vote on that, please? All those in favour of deferral? Thank you very much. Uh, we shall now go to planning application number four. Ms. Harper will present the item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Durbandale Farm is a substantial operational agricultural holding. And as you can see from that slide, is well situated in the open countryside. The application seeks planning permission for the erection of an agricultural building, the construction of a concrete hard standing, and the construction of a crushed stone hard standing cattle truck. From the slide, you can see what the situation is 
at the moment, like the existing unmade yard area, which will be replaced with the concrete, the existing manure heap, which will be covered by the building, and the field where the cattle are led to and from the grazing land. The overall development is proposed as a means to reduce the wider environmental impact of Durvendale Farm. The scheme primarily seeks to reduce dirty water runoff to existing water courses and land drains. Subject to the conditions, your officers consider that the application is acceptable and therefore it is recommended for approval. I have nothing further to add to the report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, I'll now open to you. Any questions or comments? If there are none, does anybody wish to make a proposal? Yes, Clive. Thank you. Does yes, Councillor Woodbury. Thank you. Yes, Chair. Um, I'm in agreement with uh, Councillor Pearson for all the same reasons to uh, control the runoff from the uh, manure stack, and uh, I have just on the right. So I <coughs> second that proposal, please. Okay. If there are no other comments, or we can move to a vote. We have a proposal and a seconder. Uh, all those in favour, please raise your hands. That's you, then, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, won't be any abstentions. Planning application number five. Uh, Mr. Smith will present the item. Thank you. Yes, so this application relates to land at North Bay, um, uh, commonly known as the Bulge area, which is um, roughly equidistant between uh, Peace Home Gap and uh, the Sea Life Centre. Uh, so it's, it's shown on this plan. So the next one, um, the you can see on the horizontal plan, the the sea, sea is at the south, so it's to the north of uh, uh, the area uh, where the uh, path emerges from the open air theatre, uh, and further further back inland are, is the um, Albemarle uh, water park and uh, residential houses behind an area of open space. So the photographs here are ones which were taken when there were four different attractions on the site, uh, which is the maximum observed this su summer. Oh, yeah, sorry, the, the following one was actually an, uh, at an earlier stage when there were just two of the um, attractions. Uh, and, and then this is from the north, and then this is from the promenade. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think, I th one gets a flavour of the type of um, ride and attraction which uh, is proposed or ha has, has been there over this summer, uh, initially under permitted development rights, or, although uh, it's, this application is retrospective. The, um, as I say, the photos show, show four rides. In the application, it states there will be up to eight rides. Not all of them were um, operated this summer. Uh, but I think what members should bear in mind, this is an application for the change of use of the land, as, as there is only, if granted, there's only limited control over what rides would actually be operated on the site, although there might, might be some potential for con control by conditions. The ap 
applicant has circulated a letter to members with various photos. I won't go into that into detail because hope, hopefully members will have read uh, this. But I think a couple of things I just want to draw out. Firstly, in terms of the visual impact, it's necessary, necessary to make an assessment against what the site was like before. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please could all students make their way to Grand Hall and begin to take their seats. Thank you. Yes. Uh, where was I? Uh, yes, the, in terms of the appearance, it's necessary to make a judgment against what the appearance of the site as it, as it was immediately before the different rides and attractions were placed on the site, i.e. grass and with some areas of hard standing rather than um, possibly the historical situation where there was the remnants of the chairlift up to the former Marvel site. Uh, uh, the, the photographs circulated also show um, a uh, Ferris wheel which was uh, on the site about 10 years ago. I, I've not been able to find any planning history relating to that, but I believe it may have been uh, a situation again where p permitted development rights were exercised up to a certain number of days per year. Uh, so. In terms of the report, um, I have nothing further to update in terms of um, consultee comments. Um, the main concern with this application from your officer's point of view is the visual impact on a prominent site. Uh, the application is recommended for refusal on those grounds. Thank you. Thank you. We have one public speaker, Mr Oliver Corbett, if you would like to come. Just to remind you, you have three minutes. Uh, I will let you know when there's 30 seconds remaining just to, so you can bring your uh, comments to a close. Uh, if you'd like to start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Councillors, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, we are at this point to see this application recommended for refusal, um, which brings a number of benefits to the North Bay and to Scarborough in general. The application seeks permission for the seasonal sighting of several vintage amusement rides during the summer months, during which time it provides entertainment for young families and adults of all ages at the seaside. On the single reason for refusal of visual amenity, as, as Hugh has just referred to there, um, the context of the site is that it previously hosted an abandoned chairlift, which led up to the Marvels Amusement Park, which has been left to, to ruin, and is something of an eyesore in the North Bay. As recently as July 2021, and as documented on YouTube and in the local press, the amusement park is still abandoned and contains dangerous structures which sit to the detriment of the North Bay, uh, as we showed in the photographs circulated before the meeting. Um, returning to this site, the applicant removed the, the unattractive rusting structures and grasses site at significant cost several years ago, but to the benefit of those who visit the area. The applicant is also the owner of the chalets and the cafe adjacent to the site, all of which have been regenerated to significantly improve the character of the area, and the applicant continues to invest in the area today. We acknowledge that there are a number of objections to the application, including five from residents who face towards the site from the top of the hill. The remaining objections come from residents across the town and elsewhere, including Driffield. Um, in terms of any potential impact on those five properties, they are at least 180 metres away, beyond the miniature railway, and uh, in closer proximity to Alkamari Water Park. With, with restrictions on music being played as part of the amusements, which I'm aware were raised as part of the objections, we don't consider there to be a significant impact on the amenity of these residents. Uh, the applicant, uh, having, having read the committee report, is also happy to commit uh, to reducing the number of rides to only four, if this would help to address any concerns that councillors have. We therefore consider that if, if the application is refused today, the applicant does have no choice but to, to appeal the decision to, to continue to utilise the site. As, as we consider the proposal is an appropriate seaside attraction, which does not have a significant visual impact on the character of the North Bay, we would respectfully request that you approve this application today. Thank you, councillors. Thank you.
now open this up to members' questions. Hazel Linsky. Thank you, Chair. I've lived here all my life, and all of the people who know Scarborough know that the South Bay is the commercial side, and the North Bay, where I was brought up, was the side where it was kept natural. Yes, there was one or two problems with the, the chairlift, but I go down there, and this summer, when I actually saw the rides, I realized that they were less than perfect. If you're going to actually put a, something on a site, surely you don't bring in any old ride from anywhere and plant it in Scarborough. I believe that the decision of the officers is right and that we should keep the north side for people to play, for children to play, and to keep it natural. Thank you. Councillor Bill Chan. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I know this site very well. And we seem to have, uh, I remember when there was chalets all the way along. A few years now, and I do appreciate the fact that these are more older rides. But if you look at them on the pictures which we've been provided, um, the roundabout is a hand-driven, not a motor-driven thing, because that's what it used to be. Uh, same with the swings. And, the swings used to be on the south side, if I remember when I was a child, on the platform that was done down there. So I'm, I'm not seeing this as something which is going to drive away visitors. I'm seeing this as an attraction where visitors may come. We seem to have everything up to that little cafe coming from the corner cafe. But then going forward, there doesn't seem to be a lot until you actually hit the Sea Life Centre. And I don't think that this is going to cause an absolute ruckus in the town. I think that... It's an opportunity, and somebody's identified the opportunity by being there for a few years. They've identified the fact that this could possibly be a business, could create an income, and could create jobs. So I'm, I'm not actually against it. So I'm going to say that I would oppose the decision by the officers, and I would move that we accept it. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, I'd like to refute the idea that it, um, that it uh, doesn't it doesn't take away from the uh, visual. Aspect. Could you hold the microphone Sorry. closer to you? Yeah, that it doesn't take away from the visual aspect of the um, of the North Bay. I think it's it's quite visually jarring um, in appearance, and, um, and you know that's for that reason I wouldn't really accept it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Casey. Uh, yes, I, I've been past this a few times uh, over the last uh, few months and I find it really, really poor, poor quality and unsightly uh, and, and in some instances dangerous because I've seen cars coming in from the open air theatre and the other direction, uh, sometimes at speed, only two weeks ago in fact, uh, which could cause an issue if children are congregating in the area, so I think safety is an issue. But yeah, it doesn't look suitable for this area, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to make a comment? Yes, Councillor Theresa. Mm, it kind of looks like a hodgepodge of everything. I mean, I think there's something about vintage that strikes us all as, uh, as nostalgic and something we, we like to see. But unless something is restored well and uh, maintained well, then it just looks a bit messy. And also, you can't really bring out the vintage aspects when you've got big bouncy castles and bouncy slides there as well. That does bring in... It, it just looks like a hodgepodge, really. There doesn't seem to be any real plan to have something specific. It just seems like a random selection of things. So I don't like it, and I'll be voting against. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? We have had it moved for acceptance. Can I have a seconder for that? No. Nobody's going to second it. Uh, would somebody like to move for rejection then? Councillor Casey and Theresa, a seconder. 
Does anybody wish to make any further comments? No? Shall we go to the vote? All those in uh, favor of rejection. Uh, anybody against? Yeah. Any abstentions? No. Would the planning officer summarise the decision? Yes, thank you, Chair. So, for item five, the resolution of committee is in accordance with the uh, recommendation set out in the report, so planning permission is refused. Thank you. We'll move to agenda item number six. Uh, Mr Whitmore will present. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this um, application is uh, a site in the local plan known as HA8 uh, for housing development and OS1 for open space. You can see it on the, the plan there, members, and it sits to the north of the existing development north of Eastfield known as Middle Deepdale and effectively uh, will, will form a northern extension of that ongoing development. The uh, application seeks, uh, in outline, uh, the development of the site for housing uh, and with a, with a first phase in detail of 107 dwellings. Uh, I believe perhaps the front, front sheet says 106, but the, the application has been amended uh, as, as a report to, to 107 units. Um, in its nature, it's a hybrid application. Uh, the chair just asked me if I could make this clear to members at the outset. So members will be aware normally we deal with a, an outline application for an entire site. In this case, we have an application for an outline development across the whole site, but in, it includes a phase of detailed development. So we term this a hybrid application. If permissions resolved to be granted today and subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement, over various matters. Uh, when the decision notice is issued, I expect that it may contain two schedules of condition, conditions. One schedule for the outline permission, obviously relating to future applications for further details, uh, and one for the detailed scheme, uh, clearly relating to the, the additional information that we may need in respect of that particular development. Um, I'll just, I've got a few things to report, members, but I'll just um, set the context a bit, uh, a bit further, I think. Um, here's a, a, a page of, of photographs. I'm afraid I haven't managed to find the time to get out to the site myself to photograph it, but um, I think it's clear from those photographs that the site is a, a gently sloping uh, arable, is gently sloping arable land, uh, rising gently... Um, to the north above the existing uh, land that, that is being developed as Middle Deepdale. There's currently a bridleway path that runs across the site, and, and I'll show you the, the alignment of that later. And that is proposed to be uh, an amend, um, diverted to an amended route. And you'll have noted in the report that there's a, a separate uh, process that would need to be go, gone through to, to divert that route. Um, separate to, to this decision today, um, but equally uh, the, the report asked for members' authority to, uh, to allow officers with legal colleagues to, to um, undertake the necessary diver diversion order in due course. The context of the site uh, for those members that, that haven't been um, here for many years is that um, in, in the last local plan, in the 1999 local plan, the, the, the two sites there in an in a orange colour just north of, of Eastfield uh, were, were HA1 and HA2 in the 1999 local plan. 
Uh, and those have got an outline permission and quite a number of reserved approvals now uh, for a development up to 1,350 homes with a link road, which you can see the, the route of that generally marked on with roundabout junctions uh, that, that um, in due course will link the A64 and the A165. This entails the construction of a bridge uh, across the Central Valley area, which again you can, you can see running between the, the various allocations in a north-south direction. As you can see on, on the map, the, the HA, HA8 site and the OS1 site lie on the um, eastern side uh, above the, the orange land and then we've further allocations in the local plan that will be brought forward in due course, no doubt, under HA9 and 10. Uh, the, 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 effectively, the bypass road to, to the old Filey Road, you can see just um, skirting diagonally across the top right-hand corner of the site, uh, of, the, of the map there, and then you have the link road through into Eastfield, and, and the middle deep DR development is taken off a, a roundabout from that junction. Again, I mentioned in the report that part of the land has already got an outline permission uh, under the HA2 scheme, and if you look uh, there, members, to the immediately to the north of the Link Road, um, you can see some dotted uh, areas in a, in a bluey purple um, colour, and that, that is the HA2 land. So, just one thing I want to mention at, the, uh, at this point is that I, I will need to check moving forward if members approve this scheme. Uh, the the, the exact figures that will be required or estimates of figures that will be required uh, through 106 agreements moving forward. These will be calculated in due course in any event based on numbers of, of detailed approvals, but um, I, I'm slightly concerned that we might have double counted dwellings that are already approved under HA2 with this, with this site. And the idea of incorporating part of HA2 was clearly to uh, ensure that any development was logically planned uh, and comprehensive rather than uh, appearing possibly two developments that, that didn't match up um, particularly well. So the re reasons for including that land are uh, welcomed, but uh, we just need to make sure that we are fair in working up out any planning obligation sums. At outline stage, the, the discussions around the site sought to look at different issues that, that would inform its, um, its final configuration. And I've just got a couple of drawings here from the uh, design and access statement that, that show these members. And there are a number of principles established. Uh, one was that there'd be a central north-south green space that would link uh, through to the, the green space within to the south um, within the Middle Deepdale development that then takes you through to the school and the extra care facility and through the, the link road onto, um, or the linking road onto uh, Overdale. So that was a sort of a, a direct route um, through the site um, within a green environment that uh, both uh, new existing uh, residents of Middle Deepdale and uh, older residents of Eastfield could, could uh, all enjoy in due course. The, the blue uh, lines with arrows you see is the, the idea that um, the, 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 the site is um, served by two uh, roundabouts off the link road and uh, th those will um, form separate um, pockets of development with no link between the roads. So there won't be a, um, if you like, a circular route through the site. So it breaks the, the, the areas of housing down into two uh, sets of 300. Again, the, the idea was that it felt that that um, was likely to reduce sort of uh, rat running or, or speeds on any particular road. Uh, it may be with the County Council's final um, input uh, that something like a, um, a crossing point for emergency vehicles of the, of the open space may be required, but um, clearly that would, that would be a feature that would only be used in an emergency rather than on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the other features of the, of, of the site were that um, you would see the blue um, uh, areas of, of denoting balancing ponds. So um, in, in line with sustainable 
drainage systems. Uh, the, the idea is that this site, or at least the roads from this site, should all drain to these basins, which would then, through filtration, uh, dissipate into the ground. The arrows pointing outwards are just demonstrating that the, the development is proposed to have uh, dwellings that face out onto the open, uh, open space to the west and also onto the uh, farmland beyond so that um, we avoid a, a development which uh, appears to turn its back on the, on the neighbouring open undeveloped land which um, has many benefits in visual terms for, for people uh, passing by the site on, on adjacent roads. The, the next uh, plan just shows a, a, f a few ideas around um, obviously the basins again ringed in blue, the, the um, particular green spaces in the middle of the site is the village green, uh, the central main primary access road, which I've probably called a distributor road, I suppose it's really a primary access road, uh, with, the, with the purple um, hatching. That, that is the, the greenway, uh, which is proposed to be uh, developed with a, a certain character, which I'll come back to later. And then the blue lines around the edge showing the, the rural mews, and that's with the, the dwellings looking out onto the, the countryside beyond. And as you can see, outside the rural mews housing is a, uh, a buffer zone of further planting which is proposed to uh, carry walking routes um, for uh, the benefit of, of residents of Eastfield. So all of that le has led to a, um, an indicative master plan for the site, um, as, as you see there. And um, if I can use the, the mouse, this roundabout junction doesn't actually show up, does it? Um, anyway, I'll, I'll move forward. But if you recall, members, the, the detail element of the scheme is at the eastern end. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a bit of that. The, the applicant has undertaken trial trenching for archaeology in this area where the, the detailed proposals are. Uh, and you can see the trenches there, quite sizable um, trenches. Uh, and this involves uh, an excavator and then archaeologists looking at the, uh, the topsoils and the, um, I guess the, the, the top uh, areas of the subsoil to determine any archaeological interest. Um, within this developed uh, detailed area of the site, uh, nothing of, of interest has been found and the county archaeologist has, has confirmed that no further investigation is required in that respect. Uh, you will have noted in the, in the report that it does suggest that further trial trenching should take place where the, the blue lines are shown across the, the whole of the site. Um, but the, the applicant has um, put forward the, the argument that um, they, they're, they're anticipating that other than in a, a south-west corner of the site, which is already covered by archaeology through HA2, um, that the archaeological potential of the site is likely to be low. Uh, and so what they've suggested is rather than be required to trial trench the whole of that site now before we make a determination, that if, uh, if, the, if the council's um, minded to prove the scheme, that uh, that would be an element of work that would be undertaken before any detailed proposals come forward on the remainder of the site. Uh, and to my mind, that's an appropriate compromise because it allows all of us to be aware of what archaeology has been found, if, if any is found, and clearly any designers can take account of the need to preserve any features of interest that may be found. A bit like we have over on um, HA1 with the, with the Roman remains, where um, the, the developers reconfigured uh, the, the site to, to maintain the, the, the Roman archaeology in, in an open space. So I think if trial trenching came up with something of interest such as that, clearly the, the ability to uh, research that before a detailed proposal comes forward, meaning that we wouldn't need the redevelopment um, proposal that's, that's happened on HA1. Um, drainage has been a, a large issue over the life of this um, scheme, I guess, in, in total, and I mean since the 1999 local plan. Um, because 
historically, Eastfield properties have, have suffered from overland flooding from the land that uh, this, this and other bits of the, the Middle Deepdale development are on. And, and right back, um, at the, I guess at the start of probably the late 2000s, um, we started to discuss the approach to, to drainage. And through that, eventually in 2013, a, a surface water um, strategy was, was uh, agreed with, at that point, all the drainage parties, the, um, the Environment Agency, Yorkshire Water, our own drainage engineers and the Internal Drainage Board. And the proposals really have been taken forward on that basis. Uh, and I suppose this map sort of indicates the, the, the basis of, 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 the, um, of the drainage philosophy for the site. If you see the, the red area in the middle of the plan, that is the, the area of land that historically has drained to the, the points X and Y, which are, are the Deepdale watercourse running through the middle of the site. And that, that runs through the, the Dell in Eastfield and through various culverts under the business park and, and onto the uh, internal drainage board ditch system before eventually reaching the, the, the River Derwent. Um, and obviously in developing the, 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 the different coloured pockets of land either side of that, um, the, the drainage of those pieces of land uh, need to be brought into, into the system that exists, the, the waterway that, that exists. Um, so in order to make capacity for that additional uh, water eventually reaching the, um, the, the, the um, water course, uh, a, a fairly impressive system, it has to be said, of um, drainage attenuation features um, and uh, hydro brakes that um, reduce flows of, of water uh, are, are in place on the site. And eventually, or in, 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 in reasonably sh short time frame, uh, a, a, um, an embankment is going to be built in, in, the, in the site, just north of the Dell, and, and that will create uh, that will involve a series of hydro breaks in itself, and what that eventually will do is on in, in a very severe storm event, um, that would create a um, an area of, of, of um, ponding, um, a balancing pond, if you like, within the Deepdale Valley itself, holding up to 3,000 cubic meters of water. Uh, I have to say, just seeing the the, the infrastructure that's going in on site. Uh, I think it would have to be a fairly um, uh, intense event that, that, that lasted a fair period of time before any, any real ponding occurred in that valley. Um, within Middle Deepdale itself, as currently built, there are a number of uh, substantial uh, tanks underground that, um, that will hold um, very Im impressive volumes of water before um, releasing them at a low rate into the watercourse. So, um, um, I, I guess I'd probably like to um, have members rest assured that um, drainage has been very carefully looked at throughout the development of Middle Deepdale and it continues uh, with this scheme. The, the applicant has done a lot of work on, on drainage. You'll have seen the various documents outlined in the report. Um, unfortunately, I've had a, a lack of response from the drainage bodies generally. But after a, a bit of chasing, the, the lead local flood authority has written and their, their comments in the report demonstrate that they are content with the work that has been undertaken and the drainage strategy moving forward. Um, but they've also uh, recommended a number of conditions to uh, ensure that the detailed um, drainage system is, is looked at uh, as, as it comes forward. The, the site uh, lies within um, the catchment area two of the ground source protection zone. Uh, so again, it's, it's in the less um, um, uh, sensitive area that, that the majority of Eastfield and some of the original Me Middle Deepdale development is in, which is, is the pink land there. The, the site is all within green. So that, that obviously um, takes some... Um, uh, concerns away from um, from uh, contamination of groundwater. The 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 
level of work that's gone on in drainage is, is, is quite impressive in the documents. For instance, I just thought I'd show members a, a number of items. This, this is the calculations that demonstrates the amount of surface water that would be um, taken from uh, the, the, the drains to the, the roads that would then link into the, the balancing pond that you see there in the, um, in, in the bottom of the, the drawing. And um, basically there's, there's a, a, a sort of two ways that this site is drained of surface water. Roads into a surface water holding pond and then um, roofs of the, the properties uh, generally will be uh, through soakaways in the gardens, uh, again, subject to further testing. Uh, but if, if infiltration isn't possible to the degree that developer hopes, then alternative um, provision, probably underground storage would be required to the link, then link into the piped system within, um, within the earlier phases of Middle Deepdale itself. Again, a, a similar scenario on the other side. Uh, and another piece of work that's been done is uh, looking at exceedance flow. So this is when, when all, 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 if you like, when, when there's a real deluge and the, the pipe system can't deal with all the water, um, the, the local flood authority now require developers to demonstrate that in those situations, roads will carry the additional weight of water. So again, this plan demonstrates how that would um, be achieved and, and ultimately the green slither that you see along the, the bottom of the housing there is, is a swale that would take the, ex, the exceedance water and discharge it, sorry, across the road into the, into the drainage pond. So quite a, a, a detailed piece of work. Um, just the master plan again, I'm just going to home in on a couple of features now, members. So um, again, the uh, main open space to the west, the green space in the middle of the site, uh, just homing on, on that, um, running through to the green area in Middle Deepdale itself. On to the detailed proposals. Um, the report deals with these, um, just explains that by and large the, the, the site is quite challenging as with other parts of Middle Deepdale because development has to face out, um, it can't be inward looking, but the designers have um, come up with an appropriate configuration to allow that to happen. Um, houses look out onto all the streets and they look out onto the green spaces. Um, the landscaping um, within the site, the, the various features including the balancing ponds provide the ability for uh, additional wildlife habitat uh, moving forward which clearly is um, something that we'd like to see a net gain in uh, and given the agricultural land uh, by and large was, was, um, was poor in, in ecological terms uh, the, the various green spaces and the networks across this site can very much improve upon uh, the biodiversity of the site as a whole. Uh, just a quick um, slide showing that um, obviously with gardens shown in, in green, green um, there that um, you can see the, the amount of green space that remains in between the housing and the roads. Looking at the outside of the, the site, the detailed phase, we have this buffer zone that the, the green line denotes, uh, and that's the area where we will see a, um, a, uh, you know, a, 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 an area where um, uh, not only biodiversity can be established, but people can use as uh, nature trails and, and recreational route. And again, I've just included this, members, because this demonstrates mm -hmm. the houses looking north out of the site. Hopefully you can see on the plan looking over um, um, private access courts onto the green space. Uh, so again, as I say in the report, rather than historically with this sort of development, putting a big fence all around the site and everybody's back garden butts up to that, this site looks over that green space, both for the attraction of longer distance views and also for the safety of users of the green space and the bridleway. And that happens on the east side and again on the east, uh, on the southern side where the, the swale is proposed um, as, a, as a buffer zone with the, the existing properties on phase two, phase three of HA2. I'll come back to that later, Mem, because you, you'll have noted there's been some concerns from residents of, of the existing dwellings that, that I'd just like to uh, cover. Again, moving through the character areas of the site, um, which I mentioned earlier, this is a, a, an illustration of the, the greenway the, the main 
um, access road, road through the site uh, and some um, visualisations of how that might feel with properties set back from the road with um, gardens planted with trees and shrubs uh, and, and with uh, on the eastern side uh, small parking courts for dwellings um, to give that sort of green frontage. Again just the, the, the landscape architect and architects have worked up a couple of um, indicative uh, layouts so um, moving into the site you can see the large garden on the corner and then moving through the site uh, the idea that garages are set back from the frontages so that hopefully cars are generally parked uh, away from the street to um, really make sure that the, the trees and the, the hedgerows dominate in, in views. Uh, around the balancing pond areas, housing looking onto those balancing ponds, again showing the, the ability for, for those to, to att become attractive features for habitat. Um, the, the central village green area, uh, and also the, the rural muse, so this is the, the green zone around the, the north and eastern edge of the site. Just a selection of the houses proposed. Um, traditional in design, similar to those that uh, Kebble have built uh, just um, south of the site. Um, uh, the, the, the including houses such as the, the two here that you see, which are sort of loosely termed corner turners, so that um, where you have a junction, you have one property that uh, has its main elevation to, to the road, and then as you turn the corner, uh, the, the connected property then has um, its, its main elevation to the road uh, with, with, with detailing on the gable end to, to create a, a interest in the street. And again, just a, a range of um, detached and semi-detached properties, all uh, all of sort of designs that we're, we're familiar with in, in, in Middle Deepdale. A uh, couple of street scene drawings just to show members how the sort of red and buff brick and the, uh, the, the, the grey tiles and the, and, and the pan tiles will, will sit together to um, create an attractive um, assemblage. And then just uh, to deal with a few issues of um, uh, levels. This is, this is a plan just showing a number of uh, sections that the architects provided. Uh, and, and this um, in indicates how HA8 and uh, HA2 dwellings um, relate to each other. And I won't go through those in details, member, because I've, I've got one section here that the architect's drawn up for me and I've shared with the concerned residents and, and largely I believe it's put um, minds at rest. And this is showing that the, the house on the left-hand side, side gable, uh, that, that is a, a property within the existing developed part of Middle Deepdale uh, on um, Oozel Grove. Um, you can see its back garden, then its um, rear fence line. And the swale is then indicated by a depression in the, in, in the site uh, with, with obviously wildlife planting around it and some tree planting. And then the new development, HA8, is, is the property uh, facing towards us on this drawing on the right-hand side. And the idea is that the new development faces along and across the open space, but not directly towards the rear elevations of, of, of Oozel Grove properties, and that also levels will be amended so that whilst this green swale is generally a, a sort of wildlife corridor and a, and a, a drainage corridor, uh, it could be used for, for walkers, um, and therefore the, the people there indicate that those level changes should ensure that the, the rear boundaries provide privacy to the, the gardens of Oozel Grove um, uh, dwellings. Currently the land is slightly uh, raised up, um, I think due to interim engineering works to, to form an access track and also create a, a barrier for overland flows and that's currently giving the residents concerns that there's a, a very easy sort of ability to overlook into their gardens but um, I, I, I'm of the view that that won't arise in due course. However, however, as I say in the report, we're recommending that a condition be imposed that allows the issue of rear boundary um, heights to, to Ooze Grove properties to be considered once we can see um, matters on the ground. And again, I think by and large that's given comfort to existing residents, obviously previous um, purchases of the, of the applicant. Okay, so um, a 
apologies that that was a, a fairly long explanation, but I, I, I thought it was helpful. Um, I just want to update members on a couple of matters. Uh, as you're aware from the report, I haven't had formal comments from North Yorkshire County Council's or Highway Authority. However, I confirm that they've received the further assessment and modelling that they requested uh, and that the applicant's highways engineer has, has discussed this recently with um, the case officer. I think, um, well, I'm aware that the case officer has confirmed that uh, following receipt of the revised assessment, uh, the local authority, highway authority, has no objection to lifting the cap on numbers of dwellings that can be brought forward in the Middle Deepdale site. Um, in advance of the bridge being built uh, and this is based on a reassessment of trips being generated by the current development. Now I think as we work through with the um, Highway Authority they, they, will, they will want to look at um, a number of matters and, and that is localised crossing of the link road um, which has been a concern to, to the ward member and, and a number of residents. So we've got two, two issues to look at moving forward, I think, or possibly three. One is how do we make sure that there's safe profit crossings of, of the link road? And the applicant has confirmed that, obviously, the infrastructure that the County Highway Authority considered to be, to be necessary, they, they will fund that. That's likely to be signalised crossing junctions. Uh, and two, the, the issue of any impacts of additional highway uh, movements from this site through... Um, through to the junctions of Seymour Road and Filey Road. And it may well be that the developer will be asked to make um, contributions to off-site junction improvements. I think it's fair to say the applicant's highway consultant doesn't envisage this being necessary, but that's obviously going to be a, a, a point of discussion between the two parties before, before those issues are finalised. And I expect the, the, the third point is, uh, is just whether there is a particular... Um, number imposed on the, the development of, of houses that can be built before the bridge is put in place. Now, I should have explained earlier, members, that when the, the Middle Deepdale scheme in the local plan was um, put through, and if I can just go back to the slide for that, um, please bear with me. Oh. Let me just ping back. When the, the, the sites, the 1,350 homes were, were developed or, or permitted on the, on the orange sites, the, the bridge that links the, uh, the, the two sites and obviously the A roads on either side, uh, there was a condition that stipulated that no more than 800 houses could be built before that bridge was put in place. Now, the, the applicant uh, has done two, two things. They, they've, in, in bringing forward this HA8 application, their highway engineers have made a case for the bridge not having to be in at the point of 800 dwellings being built. Uh, and both the highway authority, local highway authority, North Yorkshire County Council and Highways England have accepted that principle. And they've also got an application which I think will be with you in due course for a variation of the, uh, of the condition, condition 30 of the, of the outline permission that, that stipulates the 800. Um, so, uh, as I say, members, the, the, originally we were looking at 800 as a maximum, but clearly the Highway Authority uh, and, and the um, Highways England are com comfortable that additional housing can come forward before the bridge is in place. Now, there is, a, um, there is a, as a matter of fact, a sort of end date for the bridge. Under the, um, the contract between Kebble, Keepmoat and the council, when the council sold the, the land on the... Um, uh, west side of, of the valley, um, there is a, a contractual requirement that the bridge is built uh, before the 31st of December 2026. I think the issue that, that has arisen in the interim is that um, Kebble have been very um, uh, proactive on their site. They've introduced a number of developers and, and hence a good proportion of the Middle Deepdale HA2 scheme is now built out and we, we by and large have planning permissions in place for the, the construction of the rest of it. Keepmoat, on the other hand, on the west side have, have really approached their site as a single developer and they're developing out the site at a much slower rate. 
Uh, and so that what, what's happened there is that it, it's really held up or, or they're, they're, they're not feeling the, the urgency to put the bridge in that clearly um, Keepmoat are. Uh, and Keepmoat really have um, the urgency that Kebble are. So Kebble really are having to, to make the case for more dwellings to be possible before that bridge goes in, but being very much a willing party in the construction of that bridge. Um, so I, I guess... Um, you know, that, that will be part of the discussion, members, but as I say, um, in, in principle, the, 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 the issue of the bridge not being required at this moment in time has been agreed. Right, I think, I think I've largely covered everything. Um, as, as set out in the report, it's considered that scheme, both in terms of the outline proposals and the detailed phases, meet the relevant policies of our local plan um, and therefore I'd like to recommend that uh, members resolve to grant uh, the scheme uh, permission today uh, subject to the um, elements set out in the, the uh, section about planning obligations so we'll need a, a section 106 agreement signed before we issue the decision uh, and also the, the conditions that I've set out in the, in the report. But in addition, clearly I want to give members, um, or I, I'd like to seek delegated authority from members that officers um, work with county council highway colleagues and the applicant to ensure that there's agreement over the crossing facilities for pedestrians at the site and that any off-site works that are required to mitigate um, any impacts at junctions are agreed and again, in likelihood, um, commuted sums will be brought forward through 106 for that. Um, so subject to delegated authority for those issues, uh, and in due course I'm happy to report on the uh, final outcome of that to the Chair in order to update members before the decision is issued. Thank you. We have one public speaker, uh, Mr Stephen Longstaff. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll just open this up to questions. If uh, any members have any questions they wish to ask. Uh, Glenn first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's uh, 7.42 in, uh, in the application. Um, it's the... the the, um, affordable housing that um, you know looking to uh, produce 10 percent of the total um, of the development but what does concern me it does say in brackets subject to viability um, you know I mean is, is, is that a loophole where perhaps um, a contractor or a developer could say oh you know we can't afford to provide affordable homes um, is, is there any conditions we Surely this should be taken into account, you know, when they're pricing the job up to start with. Yeah, um, I guess that, that, that's always there as a possibility, the viability. We can't, we can't ever say, you must provide 10% housing, that, that's the bottom line. Um, but um, if, if a developer wishes to make a case that in viability terms they need to drop the percentage, they, they will have to go through a fairly rigorous procedure with ourselves and, and ultimately, we would report back to you on that, uh, members. So at this stage, my anticipation is that this scheme should bring forward 10% affordable housing. Um, clearly, if, if uh, a contrary view is taken through the developer, we, we will report that to you in due course, and members will be able to make a final decision on that. I have Rich Moore and then Phil Kershaw, and then Roberta. Thank you, Chair. Um, mine's with regard 7.19, 720. Um, as many people throughout the borough, the first I heard of Roman ruins at Eastfield was through a development, and, uh, and I have visited, and I have found them to be uh, quite spectacular, and have been made aware that these could be unique amongst the whole Roman Empire. And, um, and so reading um, this a Grampian condition um, about perhaps 
is a planning condition attached to a development site that prevents the start of a development until off-site works have been completed. I, it seems to me as almost that Keep Moat acted slowly. They, they, they did the trenches. We got the archaeologies in. And, and, and have really towed the line and done an accepting, uh, absolutely brilliant sterling job. From this, it looks like we're looking to make a compromise, perhaps because the archaeology may not or may be there, but we're looking to, to take a step away and, um, and proceed a little quicker insofar as we, uh, we, we proceed and then start to dig trenches along the way rather than the other way around, which goes against what the... Um, the, the, the archaeologist is, is, is saying in 7.19. So I am concerned a little bit about that, almost as though Kebble is wanting to do things with more haste than on the other side. And I guess I just need some reassurance as to why that is, um, especially when it was drawn to my attention that one side um, is looking to have the bridge built quicker. It just, just raises a few questions there, I think. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to characterise it as Kebble or a, a hasty. I think Kebble are, are, are probably developing at a, what you would call a normal rate. I think the Keep Moat scheme, Keep Moat sort of um, started developing on Kebble's side before moving over to the other side. So they've always been behind. Um, but their rate of build being a single developer is clearly less than if you've got Kebble and, and a number of Linden, for instance. Uh, uh, and others keep moat themselves back in time were developing. So clearly, whilst one side's maybe developing 40 to 50 dwellings a year, the other side potentially 100, 150 dwellings. Um, and it's just the way they, they've, they've tackled their um, sites. Now, Kebble themselves have done a lot of archaeology on their site. Um, HA1 and HA2 have been quite substantially... Uh, um, trial trench and a lot of strip and excavation has occurred on, on the um, Kebble site itself and, and I've seen that in progress over the years. So I, I don't think they're trying to, if you like, um, move along without due caution. What I think the, the situation is, we, and I think given, given that Roman archaeology is fairly unique, I don't, hopefully it's so, un, well, it'd be nice if it wasn't that unique that we found another one, but I think that's unlikely. Um, but, but what we are, what officers are saying, I suppose, is let's accept the county, county archaeologist's point of view, but also the developers. And to me, the, the, the appropriate compromise is to say, um, let's give the developer the benefit of a planning permission or resolution of the planning permission. They've got a lot, quite a bit of work to do around other areas as well, but equally, in doing that, we say to them, before you come in with any detailed proposals, so sort of different to the keep moat scenario where they already had a detailed scheme and they had to redesign it. Do your archaeology and then from that we'll understand if there are any features that you need to take account of in developing those um, detailed schemes. So I think it's, um, it's really protecting the, the archaeological interest of the site but just allowing things to move forward. And as I say, um, we... I guess to a degree, um, it's, it's been quite a long time bringing this report to you. I had this application back at the start of the year, and due to certain consultees and things, you know, we're, we're in October. So I guess it's just, as time goes on, the developer's saying it'd be nice to sort of get to a point where we know we can move forward in earnest, obviously put in these additional archaeological investigations, knowing that, that, that down the line we'll be developing the site in some shape or form. Thank you. Councillor Phil Kershaw. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I missed the point about the uh, S106 um, on this. Um, is, did you say that they would be recalculated? And if they are going to be recalculated, are they going to be substantively the same or is it going to be a big difference? Um, I, I suspect in the fullness of time, because we index these figures, you know, and they won't be paid for years to come in, in the stage way as the development because the figures probably largely will reflect what we have there. But ultimately, if we, we're obviously double counting, we, we, we're, we're taking potentially tens of thousands of pounds from development that's already paid its 
fair share towards education. So all I'm saying is, I suspect by and large the figures will be the same, but we need to make sure that we're apportioning any monies to the development that is new, not the development that is brought into the scheme but already has a planning consent. Um, and, and, and again, most of these figures will be through calculations moving forward. As we have a detailed proposal in, say, the next phase of a, 100 houses, we'll know the nature of those houses, so we'll be able to say to the developer, um, in terms of education, in terms of open space, this, this is what this scheme produces, as we are with the, the, the first phase where we've got exact calculations for, for health and uh, off-site sports. Thank you. Roberta Squires. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a few things I've sort of noted as we've gone along. Some things have been mentioned. I'm glad the bridle way has been looked at because it is an important one and well used. Uh, the habitat, everything seems to have been looked at. And I think, you know, this area is a deprived area. But th as these sites are becoming built, it is changing the look of Eastfield. It is bringing it up. And I think it's bringing it up to the point where Eastfield is going to be looked at differently. They're going to get more feedback, more grants, everything. You can see that. The whole area is uplifted somehow throughout Eastfield, and I think that's really impressive. Um, a bit concerned about, and I know it's just been mentioned, but the CCG amount. I just feel that this is not particularly enough. I don't think it ever will be, but I think really we have to start looking, particularly in that area, as it serves a bigger area of Kate and Osgaby, Crossgates, with the, uh, with the doctors, etc. It's almost to capacity, and I think at some point a bigger amount has to be sort of, or a bigger building will have to be sought out. Um, you, you've mentioned affordable housing. I think 10% is good, but it, it says, I know, I don't think, I mean, Mr. Walker put me right on this, but I don't think we can put anything on. Um, in Eastfield, I, I believe, I mean, I'm there a lot, is it's a generation thing. They, they stay, they stay and they move down in generations. It would be lovely to see a, a condition put on somewhere that these affordable houses were put to their local people before going out to everyone else. But in saying all that, I think they've got a lot of green spaces. I think it's well devised with the travel plan, everything. I think it's coming together really good, this area. And I, I would move this recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Just, just um, to clarify the, the CCG sum, that, that 51,405, that, that is um, a payment sought for the 107 units. In the, so they, there will be additional sums of money um, going along. So um, uh, we did collect uh, a sum of money from HA1 and HA2, I think at, at about a quarter of a million pounds there. Um, but uh, yeah, these are the figures the CCG produced for us, so we can't, <laughs> we can't ask for more, unfortunately. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I do recall something where any affordable housing would be advertised in the first three months to very local people before it went to wider field. Has that come into operation, or is that something that's going to happen in the future? Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, we Generally, the housing in, in Scarborough um, Borough um, is... is um, it sort of goes through a, a system. I think it's um, generally, obviously there's this idea that people ought to be able to move within the affordable housing mm -hmm. market so that, you know, if you, if you move to Scarborough for a job, uh, you should be able to say, I'm living in an affordable unit in Birmingham, I, want, mm -hmm. I would like, you know. But by and large, the, 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 the system is that the, the houses go to local families in need first. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because we often get, you know, concerns in Whitby that, that affordable housing there ends up being um, lived in by largely people not from Whitby. But that, yeah. if, if you talk to housing colleagues, that isn't the case. Yeah. By and large, 90% of housing in any area is, is lived in by local people. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Will Forbes. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned um, 
the signalised crossing points uh, here. I was just wondering if we, if, if it would be possible to um, to push county for um, uh, to get zebra crossings put in here, as opposed to like traffic lights. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, county um, do a lot of work on crossings and the appropriate type of crossing for a given situation, so they will very much determine the, the correct ap approach here. Um, uh, yeah, th they'll explain to you that there's d different volumes of traffic and different road types. Um, certain crossing points work better than others. Certain crossing types can be dangerous if they're put into the wrong scenario. So they will very much look at what, what the correct approach is here and, and, and clearly uh, the, the planning authority and the, the applicant will, um, will, will, will listen to that. Um, can I just come back as well? Um, I'm interested in how far someone living on the, out, on the sort of outside perimeter would have to walk to their closest um, amenities. Blimey. Um, <laughs> I would... Uh, I would just sort of hazard a guess um, and sorry, and that, that's all it is. I don't, I don't have a scaled plan with me. Um, but I would, I, I mean, I guess it's tricky, isn't it? Because depending on what you mean by amenities, of course, if, if it's open space, then there's quite a nice um, um, sort of network of green spaces. That means I would say any one of those houses within about 400 metres or so of a, of a green space that they could then m move through to others. Um, they'll be a bit further afield from the school and the... Uh, extra care facility that includes a number of shop units, but um, you know, in in in, I guess in reality, when you're on the site, if you, if you've visited, it's got a reasonably compact feel to it. So, you you may be walking up to half a mile or so, um, but um, the the. The, the sort of things feel closer than they are, if you know what I mean. But um, certainly in this 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 scheme, um, the allocation is entirely for housing, uh, with the idea that um, the the central facilities within HS2, which are the extra care facility with the shops, the cafe, and the restaurant, and the school, were to serve the the the, the, the growing scheme, and also to to serve um, parts of existing Eastfield. Um, but very much with the idea that we didn't put in a competing system that would detract from Eastfield Centre itself. Um, and it's hoped over time that the Eastfield Centre, which um, you know, could do with some improvement, and, and there's, there's uh, moves afoot to do that, will, will be an enhanced shopping um, area in due course due to the uh, additional population. Thank you. I have uh, Councillor Paul Riley and then Councillor Theresa Norton. Um, thank you. Just a question about the habitat uh, management plan. Um, I mean, looking at the design and access statements, um, listening to um, the, the, the officer's re report there, I mean, there's, there's lots of more greater diversity. There's the introduction of, of swales, communal green spaces, attenuation ponds, the, the dell in the middle, and the, 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 the lovely big open space on, to, the, to the northwest. Um, I'm just wondering what control we have over the area on the periphery to the to the north and and to the east. Uh, I remember um, the the officer said um, it, it it won't be just when you, when you look across there it will be fenced off. Um, the general public, the, the residents, will have access to that space. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what the man the um, habitat management plan says in, in in terms of controlling that space and introducing greenery given that it's outside the, the, the red line. Um, yeah. I, I do have some, some, some concerns. I, I, I tend to have a prejudice in favour of, sort of gentle density housing and, and flats with lots more green open space in, in between them. That's a prejudice I have from reading the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission report, which I occasionally make reference to. Um, and um, I think the visitors to Scarborough, when they, they come along the A165, they, they, they look across there to the, the left, and all they see is um, slightly different shaded match boxes, as far as the eye can see, with uh, very little greenery in there. I'm just wondering, can we make a better job? When, I mean, the, one, of, one of the advantages of 
of this scheme. It, it will screen, screen off what, what is there already. Um, but is, is there scope to be introducing mature trees and hedges? You, you, you say there won't be fences. Um, can, can we secure a, 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 a proper wildlife hedge with varieties of uh, indigenous native species and some, some mature trees so that it, it looks better than uh, what the, the first half of the development looks like? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I guess it's a problem with an ongoing building site that it, it never looks its best um, in the early years, but, but there, there are proposals to improve the green spaces and, and, and introduce further uh, landscaping within those. Um, you're, you're right, Councillor Riley, I think this, this site with that green edge, which is in the, it is outside the red line, which accords with the allocation, but it's within the land uh, the applicant's ownership, so we can we can tie it in for delivery as part of the permission. Um, but very much, I, I think both the developer and, and myself have thought. I think there, initially the idea was a buffer zone to soften the edge of the development, which is what the landscape appraisal said in the in the local plan we should have. But but working it through, we thought actually rather than it just being a planted belt. It really ought to be something that, that is an amenity, a walking route um, for residents. Um, and, and partly the, the bridal way may come into that. So what we're proposing is um, the ecologist for the applicant has suggested that we need a, um, I'm just trying to find the exact title, uh, an ecological design strategy and that we also need a habitat management plan. So we'll be conditioning those two. And we've also set out in the report the idea that, uh, again, as a, I've called it a Grampian condition, which is, um, which is a, condi uh, a condition that says, you know, before you do anything, you, you should do this. Strictly speaking, it's probably not Grampian in this instance, but um, effectively what it's saying is early doors before your first reserve matters approval comes forward. Uh, in tandem with those two things, we would like a landscape, open space and play implementation plan and I think tying that in with the ecological stuff, we should, we should understand what we're going to achieve there. And then clearly that will be developed in phases as, as the development comes forward. So um, that's probably something I'll report, on to you, report to you at a later date, perhaps when a, the, the first reserve matters comes in. We'll be able to just explain to members where we've got with all, with all those other um, key points of the uh, infrastructure. Okay. Councillor Theresa Norton. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've recently had um, correspondence with a resident on Oozle Grove, which is just backing onto the, this new development. Um, I'm just worried about the disparity between what Kebble says it will do in its plans and the reality afterwards. These people have been living in their homes for a year. And what they saw on the plans and what we've just seen is lots of green trees everywhere and bushes around all the, the garden plots. However, these things do exist on the show home and a couple of other homes, but lots of the residents there haven't got this. I just want to read a few things from this lady's email. Um, I just think we need to be careful Scarborough Council has itself declared an ecological emergency and I think that we recognise now that there is, we have a problem with biodiversity and it's up to new designs like this, this is when we can build back better by putting these hedgerows and trees into the plans and not just into the pictures of the plans. So um, this lady says, Although she's happy with the homes, the quality of them and the developments are very good. The snagging and the landscaping, she's had problems for a year with kebbles. So they've failed to complete the landscaping before the residents moved in. They willfully missed two full planting seasons. Where planting took place, it's substantive and different from the plan that had been used. They planted some things and then took them out afterwards. Uh, they failed to maintain trees that have been planted. Quite a few of them have died. Uh, because of the delay, residents started planting their own things up. 
this is already happening, but it could cause difficulties later on where maintenance responsibility is transferred. I think that's some technical hitch within the council. Uh, in response to complaints beginning a year ago, Kebble stated that they will not carry out any more planting. They criticised their own landscaping plan for being too full of plants and promised several times to undertake specific planting but didn't. They second-guessed by saying residents don't like plants and they don't want to keep them. These have proved unfounded. So I just would like some reassurance, please, from officers and people involved with Kebble. I'd like some reassurance from Kebble to say that we don't just have these trees on the pictures, but they will actually come. Re we need the birds, we need the bees and the butterflies, and without the planting, we won't have any of those. This lady says there's no birds coming to her garden, no butterflies. So this is the one thing we do want to see. Thank you. Can I just yep. add to that, if yep. I may, because I went on the uh, visit to see the residents in Oozle Grove, and the impression they are getting from the developer is that the planting is discretionary on their part. It's not part of a formal scheme that has been passed. And I think the arrangement we've got is fantastic, except the, the corridor that you've established. I think it's a brilliant idea, but it would be a shame if none of it came about. Yeah, yeah. And what I think we'd all like to know, and the residents would like to know, is is there any teeth to this, yeah. and how is this landscaping regarded? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the landscape proposals are integral to, to a development, and, and as you're aware, we, we almost without failure have a condition on about landscaping. So um, a landscaping scheme will be approved for Oozle Grove and, and the adjacent streets. Um, and um, yeah, where, where, where concerns are, are raised that a developer hasn't implemented them accordingly, then, then we, we have the ability to ultimately to say, you're in breach of the condition, we need this landscaping carried out. Now, th this issue has been ar uh, arisen recently, so it is something that I will um, discuss with Kebble and we'll, we'll obviously go and have a look at the approved scheme against what's on site. They have confirmed that they're undertaking some additional planting um, in, in the coming months. So um, uh, perhaps uh, in, in short order, I'll, I'll, we'll be able to um, do an audit, as it were, and see where the land lies. Thank you. Is that okay, Teresa? It is. Yeah. Can I just say one more thing? When you were talking about all the water that was coming down from the roofs and had to be drained away, could water barrels be introduced, like in homes? I don't know if that's something that be, could be suggested, but that's great for watering the plants when they do come in the summer. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually think that's possibly part of the strategy that um, houses are connected to, um, um, whatever we call them, things that collect water. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and then and then they before the, then the the excess goes into the uh, the soakaways. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Hazel, and then Councillor Bill Chad. Thank you, Chair. I actually think that this is the most involved and difficult um, report that I've seen over the last fifteen years. Obviously, that's why we have officers. And all the different points that we've been putting out, that's what we're here for. But at the end of the day, the officers are here to explain exactly what is necessary. And I would like to second the proposal that we accept this with the conditions. Thank you. Councillor Bill Chan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just a couple of questions. One, I know we're going to say we can't do it now about, but it's been well known in the Eastfield areas that the dentist system up there doesn't exist. People have got to travel such a long way. I know as a planning, we cannot insist upon a dentist being there, but it's such as lacking in the area. I mean, Eastfield now is bigger than uh, Whitby, it's bigger than Filing. Both have a dentist, Eastfield doesn't. I think it's very lacking. The second one is long term maintenance. Um, we've got some green area there which looks really nice and I think the residents will really love it. But is that, is that going to be maintained by Kebble or is that going to transfer to Scarborough Council at some point for us to maintain? Because I think we need to know, really Chair, who is going to be the long-term maintenance for this green site. 
We don't want to find out that it's been left for three years because somebody thought somebody else was doing it. And I just wonder, within that planning system, can we put something in there saying that at this point it will transfer to so-and-so? Thank you. Um, yeah, as a, as a standard approach is a condition um, that, that requires a management um, uh, scheme to be put in place for, for an open space. Uh, and effectively, if that's signed off, that, that's something that either the, the land will be offered for adoption by Scarborough Parks and Gardens, increasingly reticent about taking additional open space on due to the liabilities. Uh, so increasingly, those, that, that management scheme is then given over to a, a private management company who effectively um, maintains the land in perpetuity on behalf of residents who will pay um, you know, a, a reasonable sum of money each year towards the upkeep of, of that land. So uh, if you like this, either by the council or by a private management company, that there will be a proposal to maintain that land uh, for, for everybody's benefit moving forward. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or anything anyone said? Because we have a proposer and we have a seconder. If not, we'll go to the vote. Shall we go to the vote? Does everybody understand uh, clear about what the motion states? Anybody not clear? No? Okay, we'll go to the vote then. All those in f uh, favor of the motion, please raise your hands. It's unanimous. Everyone, yeah. I think that's unanimous. Uh, no, nobody against? No abstentions? Right. Uh, would you summarise the decision? Thank you, Chair. So uh, the resolution of committee is to grant planning permission, and that will be subject to uh, satisfactory Section 106 agreement as, as recommended by the officer, and we'll liaise with the Chair to, to ensure that's in place. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have a number seven because we've dealt with it already, so it's planning application number eight, and uh, Mr Gandolfi will present. Thank you, Chair. So this application uh, seeks planning permission for the erection of a sculpture for a 10-year period uh, to the far north of the Castle Headland in Scarborough, which is in the Scarborough Conservation Area. Um, the castle isn't a grade listed building, but it is a scheduled ancient monument. So in terms of the sculpture, You'll see it on the image on the screen there to the north of the, the main complex of Scarborough Castle, well away from the, the Castle Keep, which is further to the, to the south here. Ruins of a Roman signal station here. Um, I believe there was a gun battery around this location um, historically. That's just an, a satellite image of, of the site showing the, the various bits of um, buried archaeology uh, remains that you can see in some earthworks, as well as the perimeter walls. And the red dot at the top marks the spot of the, the proposed sculpture. So in terms of the sculpture itself, um, it is a, a representation of a, a coastal acropod. Um, the heights are illustrated in that image there, so a maximum of two metres tall um, from, from ground level, um, a length of around 2.45 uh, metres, um, and then the width is, is, is 2.27 metres there. Um, in terms of um, its fixing, um, the, there's proposed that there's three uh, anchoring um, points there, to a maximum of 0.5 metres beneath the ground. In terms of its material, it is a, a, a mix of, of concrete, um, limestone and reused glass. And it is a representation um, seeking to uh, promote uh, coastal environmental awareness as part of a wider 
the Wild Eye project, which is, uh, includes a number of projects across the borough. So the report covers four main issues, um, being the principle of development, um, design and heritage assets, buried archaeology, and uh, environmental risk. I won't go into too much detail about, about those, but I'll briefly cover them. Uh, it's the principle of development. Um, the site is within the um, designated um, defined development limits of Scarborough. Uh, so there is a, uh, it's in line with policy SD1 of the local plan, which promotes sustainable development. Um, it's also um, an existing tourism site, as I'm sure you're all aware, and there is a policy in your local plan, uh, TOU1, I believe, um, that promotes the, the expansion of existing tourist attractions. So in principle, it, it, it's an appropriate site for a, for a sculpture, um, a public sculpture. So moving on to design and, and impact on heritage assets, um, it's, it's quite a unique case that usually we consider architectural merit alongside scale, um, materials and, 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 and that type of thing in terms of design. But in this instance, given that the whole intention of the, the sculpture is to be a piece of art, um, I think we need to consider art separately away from the planning arena and really consider design in terms of scale, form and sighting um, within the site. So officers are of the consideration that given it's two metres tall, not overly large, it's sighted well away from the, the, the main physical structures on the castle headland, including the castle keep, um, and wouldn't really be seen from any public views, the Royal Albert Drive and, 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 and other public footpaths, that really the, the impact on the, the wider area would be very minimal um, and certainly not harmful. Um, if people are, um, are of the opinion that it does cause harm, um, I think there's some comfort in that the, the applicant is um, proposing to cite it for only 10 years and condition number two of your report um, requires the removal of, of the, the sculpture um, within that 10 year period. So thirdly, in terms of um, the material considerations with buried archaeology, and the county archaeologist has recommended that a condition be attached to any um, granting of planning permission However, as the site is a scheduled monument, there's, there's better legislation out there to deal with, with buried archaeology being the Scheduled Ancient Monument Act of, of 1979. Um, so the applicant and the English Heritage would, would need to seek the permission of hi Historic England um, prior to doing any, any excavation. I've put a note on, on your report, which will be attached to any decision, um, just to inform the, the applicant that there is a legal responsibility to, to get the correct consents from Historic England prior to excavating, but it's not considered appropriate to duplicate, uh, duplicate the, uh, the archaeological requirement by way of condition. Finally, in terms of environmental risk, given that the whole idea of the sculpture is to promote environmental awareness along the coast, um, I did have an initial uh, consideration that it, it is relatively close to a, a cliff that's obviously vulnerable from weather erosion. Um, I sought the, to consult the council's uh, structural engineer uh, who has confirmed that by virtue of its relatively lightweight, although it is concrete, and 25 metre uh, setting away from the cliff edge that um, it wouldn't cause any harm to the, the, the cliff in terms of its stability. Um, and certainly not for a 10 year period. Um, so really I think that's nothing further to add to the, to the recommendation in the report which is to, to uh, grant permission subject to the two conditions detailed in, in your report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? No? Yes, Councillor Casey. I'll probably be in a minority but I think it's uh, totally the wrong location for something like that. Uh, if it wants to do what it's supposed to be doing and raise awareness of coastal defences and erosion and things like that, it would be a much better place down on Marine Drive 
where it could be viewed 365 days a year for free, rather than the promised four days contained within the report, which might not even come to pass. So uh, I'll be voting against it. Councillor Richmore. Oh, sorry, would you like to reply to that? Uh, yeah, I, I, just, I just remind councillors that we are considering the statue where it is, not where it, it could be. Um, I think that's probably a, the only point to to mention um, that, um, but I think we'll leave that and, and let okay, thank you. Councillor Richmore and then Councillor Will Forbes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I see that scale, form, and sighting, I think it ticks all those boxes, but I look at it and look at it again, and I don't quite understand art because uh, to me it just doesn't look uh, like anything that I'd want to pay to go and visit. I've seen megalithic stone walls that are thousands of years old look prettier than that. Thank you. I think that's just a comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Will Forbes. Yeah, I, 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 quite like, I quite like the idea of it, really. Um, but uh, just a few points. I was wondering um, how, the trans, how we're going to transport it over to the castle. Chair. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I believe that it will be um, cast off-site and then brought uh, on, a, on a wagon. Um, you can get vehicle access up through the castle gates and, and quite large vehicles, actually. Um, I don't think it's anything we could really con control in terms of the planning permission. Um, but it would certainly be a, a consideration of Historic England in, in granting their scheduled mo monument consent. They would want to be sure that a weighted vehicle would not harm the buried archaeology beneath, beneath the grounds. And, and um, similar things do go on at Whitby Abbey quite often when they do certain events uh, with stages and whatnot at Whitby Abbey. And, and, and that will be a consideration of Historic England and English heritage as well. Thank you. I have Councillor Hazelinski, and then I have Councillor Paul Riley, and then Councillor Phil Kershaw. Thank you, Chair. When the acropods were first put on the Marine Drive, we were all get given um, small copies of them. And I can tell you, I've still got my two at home, and they don't look like that. <laughs> but. Art is in the eye of the beholder. And this beholder can't see any reason why a piece of concrete needs to be put on the castle. Because I don't think anybody will accept the fact that it's an acropod and that most people don't even know what acropods are. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Having said that, I, 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 I don't dislike it. And, uh, I, I, I disagree with Councillor Casey about putting it on the seafront. I mean, the whole idea of it is that uh, we have a, 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 a snowstorm at, at, some, at some stage. I mean, I think there is some, some, some flaw in the, uh, in the argument, possibly, where we're talk, talking about sort of climate change and we're, we're, not, we're never going to have another blizzard. But uh, I'm sort of looking forward to, the, to it uh, appearing in, in, in situ and uh, the, the snow forming, and I shall go and make sure it, it, it looks like the illustration in the uh, design and access statement. So, uh, uh, on balance, I'm in favour of it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Phil Kershaw. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think any kind of public art should be applauded, to be quite honest with you. An interpretation is in the eye of the beholder. We're all going to see different things when we look at 
any piece of art, to be quite frank with you. Uh, but I was just wondering if um, there was going to be any kind of um, <coughs> information board that would be going with this. Yeah. And as Councillor Linsky said, um, perhaps explain what an acropod is, maybe. I don't know. Thank you. The original application did include a, a freestanding um, information board ne next to the sculpture, and Historic England raised concerns to that element of it. Um, that the, the applicant withdrew that aspect of it for that very reason, but I do believe that there will be a board along the gate. Uh, there's a fence to the to the north of the along the footpath, if you, if you know it, that you walk the perimeter of the edge of the, the site, so it will be put on, on that fence, uh, just to give a little bit of information about coastal erosion, environmental uh, risk, and the, the acropod as well. Um, so, so there is a plan, and I believe that there is a digital um, plan as well, in terms of, there'll be a QR code on there that you can you can scan with your, your smartphone, go onto a website, learn about the wider Wild Eye project, and then look at all the other projects and benefits and artwork that's going on from Whitby down down the coast. So, um, so, so there is one, in short. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, just for clarification, did you move it, Councillor Riley? Uh, yes. Yes? Can we have a second? Uh, oh, hold on. I'm sorry. Councillor Theresa. Theresa Moth. Yeah, thank you. Um, when this piece of art was commissioned or whatever, was it the artist or us who put it on top of the castle? Who, who wants it to be at the top of the castle? I don't know, but, but, but I do know that there was uh, significant work with the, the artist who's Ryan Gander, who's an international art, uh, sc uh, sculpture artist um, about where it would be the most impactful in terms of um, coastal awareness. Um, I think I think they saw the castle as somewhere that it, it it's not a historic structure; it's a concrete acropod out of context. And I think that's really to try and provoke thought. But we're getting into art, really, uh, but artistic. But but. but uh, there were there were discussions, I believe, about where it should go and where best it would serve in terms of the public art and what it tries to achieve. Um, I see it looks like a good spot, but that must be one of the places where the fewest number of people will see it, really. I mean, I don't know what the numbers are in the castle, but it, they can't be that high, can they, considering the seasons? Anyway, thank you. Through, uh, <laughs> Councillor Bill Chat. Yes, Chair, I'm, I'm going to agree with Councillor Moore. You know, art is in the eye of the beholder, and I totally understand that. I just don't understand why we want a representation of an acropod less than 500 metres from about 7,000 acropods. <laughs> it just seems a little bit strange, really. It's a bit like putting a grain of sand up there and saying that's what your beach looks like. But I can't... I see it as a, an anchor, I'll be honest with you. I don't see it as an acropod, but they are functional. They are now more used around the world for coastal protection. I really see that these things have become very prominent. Um, as for its positioning, yeah, you know, if somebody didn't want to put, go and pay, just go and stand on Marine Drive. You can look at them all day for absolutely free, so there's no issue with that. But there might be more to this than what I can see, so I won't be voting. Thank you. Any more comments or no? I have a proposal. Would somebody second it? Will Forbes, Councillor Will Forbes, to second? Is everybody clear on what the motion is? Yes. Can we move to a vote then, please? All those in favour of this motion, please raise your hands. All those against? Any abstentions? No. You've got the casting vote. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> I have the casting vote. Uh, I shall be voting for it to go ahead. For it. Thank you very much.
I never thought I'd actually have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll move on to planning application number nine, nine and Ms Cornforth will present. Thank you, Chair. This application is brought before members today as the applicant is an employee of the council. I'll just briefly go through um, the proposal. So it seeks a conversion and extension of a single detached garage to form an annex. Here you can see the garage with the extension at the front of the property with the driveway to the side being retained for parking. It's just a simple uh, flat roof extension to the front which will be about four and a half square metres. The annex would comprise of a living room, bedroom in the original garage space plus a small shower room and kitchenette that will be built into the extension. The kitchenette will not have a plumbed in sink, no sorry, will have a plumbed in sink but not a mains cooker as it's the intention that the main meals of the occupier of the annex will be eaten in the main dwelling. So there's the application site with the garage with the door which will have the extension at the front there's just another photograph of the garage this is facing onto the neighboring property the garden space will be shared between the annex and the existing property and that's that's the driveway that will also be retained so officers consider the proposal is appropriate to the character and appearance of the dwelling. It will not harm the amenity of neighbours, have a significant impact on highway safety nor drainage. Condition 2 restricts the use of the annex as ancillary residential accommodation to the main dwelling currently known as 68 Thorntree Avenue and states it shall only be occupied by a relative or relatives of the occupiers of the main dwelling on that basis, the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Bilchart. Thank you, Chair. Absolutely laudable idea, this. You mm. know, let's look after our family. I mean, I mean, something what we all would like to see, but isn't always possible. I mean, you put the conditions in saying that it must be occupied by the property owner uh, or, or member of their family. So they can't sell it as a separate unit. That's really good. And, and yeah, if my mum was still alive, I'm sure I would want to do this as well, is to take care of them. So, so I will move this chair because I think it's very laudable. Councillor Roberta Swires and then Councillor Clive Pearson. Thank you, Chairman. Absolutely. Just, I will second this because it's ideally the perfect thing to do isn't it really saves on everyone yeah thank you oh yes. okay all right any other comments or questions from anybody no shall we move to a vote we have a mover and a seconder uh, all those in favor that's unanimous. i think that's unanimous thank you very much and that was the last item on the agenda. Thank you very much for your attendance and have a safe journey home. Thank you.